The story began with a man falling from a tall building. As he plummeted, he found himself pondering why he was the unfortunate one to topple from the roof. Graduation was on the horizon, and he had tenaciously clung to life's possibilities. The one certainty that pervaded his thoughts was that this was the day of his demise. Confusion clouded his mind almost as if he could say he had perished. Three months had passed since the accident. The nurse's words echoed in the ears of the woman beside him, claiming she had never witnessed a patient awaken after being diagnosed as vegetative. The woman discarded the nurse's grim statement, she refused to relinquish her hope for her grandson. Han Sung's grandmother maintained a vigil by his bedside, an unwavering beacon of hope. Though trapped within the recesses of his own mind, Han Sung perceived his grandmother's touch and even discerned her voice entreating him to awaken. Amidst the impenetrable darkness, every attempt he made to move remained futile. Days turned to nights and nights turned to days, but his grandmother persisted, refusing to abandon her grandson. She wept as she recalled the years spent raising him after the loss of his parents. Promising not to yield, she implored for a sign, any sign that he still clung to life. Inside the abyss of his existence, Hansom desperately willed himself to stir. The following day brought his brother's visit. The brother stood before him, confessing that the same tormentors who had bullied Hansom were now preying on him. Tearfully, he revealed their grandmother's toil at a restaurant to cover his medical expenses, an effort that had taken a toll on her health. Yet, Han Sum lay ensnared a captive audience through his brother's struggles and his grandmother's sacrifices. His brother's voice narrated tales of torment endured and news of their grandmother's hardships. Han Sum's eyes, though brimming with emotion, remained dry. Neither death's solace nor life's awakening lay within his grasp. Trapped in limbo, he clung to the notion that this was a prolonged dream, a dream he yearned to escape. Three years elapsed and still Han Sum lingered in his silent realm, a passive listener to the conversations that transpired around him. Snippets of information reached him through the nurses, revealing that his grandmother had collapsed. A surge of anger and frustration coursed through him, a response to the injustice of it all. Names etched in his memory, Park Minchul, Cho Yan Taek, Jung Min Ho, Kang Chang Suk, Oh Da Wan, Kim Young Chul. These bullies and even the indifferent teachers, who were the architects of his torment. If only a miracle could transport him back to the past, he mused a chance to dismantle their dominion. In a surge of pent-up rage, Han Sung unleashes fury upon Min Chiu, a minuscule semblance of retribution against his immobilized existence. His tears mingled with his anger, his voice a lament for Min Chiu's suffering, far less excruciating than the torment of vegetative life. Amidst the violence, Han Sung's mind painted a macabre tableau, his bullies lifeless before him. But revenge felt insufficient. He desired more than vengeance, he longed for their complete annihilation, meticulously planned and executed. A decade crawled by, time an abstract concept in Hyunsung's isolated existence. Slowly, painstakingly, he crafted a strategy, a plan to dismantle the world of those who had marred his life. Yet, a decade's distance rendered his plan a mere whimsy, a product of a mind detached from reality. His existence had become a tapestry of longing for an end, an end to the stasis, to the suffering. Amidst this internal turmoil, a radiant light enveloped him and a figure emerged, drawing near. Then morning dawned, accompanied by the usual sounds of a TV and the familiar aura of a blackboard. His gaze alighted upon a blackboard, his mind grappling with the surreal sight. Uncertainty draped his senses, and he hesitated to accept this reality, fearing it to be another cruel dream. Pinching his cheeks, he registered the sensation of pain, a confirmation that this was, indeed, the realm of the living. Sitting down, he prodded his thigh with a pen, feeling the acute sting, the sharpness of reality. No longer ensnared in the realm of vegetative sleep, he was awake, truly awake. A commotion nearby seized his attention, a scuffle between two figures. One assailant dominated the other, the victim's visage stamped into the ground beneath a merciless foot. It was a scene etched into his memory, the inception of his grand plan. Fear gripped his classmates, but within Hansen, a fire ignited. Against the backdrop of intimidation, he stepped forward, confronting the bully. The aggressor pivoted, skepticism evident in his eyes, questioning if Han Sung possessed the metal to intervene. In a moment that defied his own expectations, Han Sung's fist met the bully's jaw. Transported back to the genesis of his journey, a first grader once more, he stood poised at the juncture of fate. Han Sung remembered that fateful day when everything in his life changed. Park Min Chiu was the typical bully who would harass his classmates. He was half-heartedly listening to the class, engrossed in playing a game called Legend Online. He approached a smart guy in the class and asked him to level up his character for him. From that day on, Lee Jung-min became Min Chiu's in-game servant. Jung-min, who was the top student, began to see a decline in his grades. He endured Min Chiu's demands to spend his own money on buying in-game items, and the stress finally became unbearable. It was the first time Hyun Sung had witnessed violence firsthand. 
He didn't want to cause any trouble, but he remembered how Jung Min had kindly helped him with his studies here and there. Watching the smartest guy being beaten up while no one helped stirred something in him. He just couldn't stand by and watch. Hyun Sub made the decision to confront Min Chiel. All of his classmates tried to dissuade him, warning that it could become tiring if he intervened. Hyun Sub's confidence came from his prowess and physical education and his standing in the hierarchy of boys' rankings. Min Chiel's name didn't evoke fear in him like it did in others. With determination, he approached Min Chiel, asking him to stop. The teacher arrived shortly after the situation was handled irresponsibly. Nevertheless, this marked the turning point. Min Chiel began to target Hyun Sun relentlessly. Each day, he and his gang would drag Hyun Sun, subjecting him to brutal beatings, leaving no time to recover. Even after school, there were nights when sleep eluded him due to the bullying, such as running errands for the bullies. Hell seemed like the only word that could describe his predicament. The classmates looked on in horror as Min Chiel received a slap. Hyun Sung seized him by his blonde hair, forcefully slamming his head onto the table. Blood trickled from Min Chiel's nose. The classmates found it hard to reconcile this with the class president they knew. Hyun Sung struck Min Chiel again, the memory etching itself into his mind as if replaying in a loop until he fell into a coma. Hyun Sung had deduced that Min Chiel relied on his physical strength, being a typical brawler. However, Min Chiel wasn't accustomed to being on the receiving end of blows, making it likely he would crumble after the first counterattack. Hyun Sung had meticulously planned this moment, mentally rehearsing the sequence countless times over the past decade. He seized Min Chiel by the vest and slammed him against the wall. Then, summoning all his strength, he delivered a powerful kick to Min Chiel's body. Hyun Sung had waited for this moment for so long that he no longer cared whether Min Chiel was beaten to death or not. He had resolved that if Min Chiel tried to raise his face, he would kick him in the face. If he attempted to block with his hand, Hyun Sung would break it. Suddenly, a chair hurtled towards Hyun Sung. A few guys barged into the classroom, ready for a fight, urging Hyun Sung to seize. But he refused, and they couldn't shake the feeling that he had crossed into madness. These were Min Chiel's gang members, and among them was Jung Min Ho. Min Ho couldn't fathom that Hyun Sung didn't anticipate the gang's retaliation if he targeted one of their own. Yet, Hyun Sung appeared unafraid. The group was dubbed Min Chiel's gang primarily because he took the lead in bullying. But the true powerhouse was Kang chang -suk. Some students alerted everyone that the teacher was approaching, prompting the gang to disperse. Class resumed, and Min Chiel sat at the back, reliving the ordeal. He remembered the initial punch, but at some point, he found himself sprawled on the floor, enduring a relentless beating. He felt humiliated and immersed a burning desire to exact revenge on Hyun Sun. He regretted dropping his guard, realizing that if he hadn't, he might have avoided the brutal assault. Min Chiel reasoned that Hyun Sung's actions were likely spurred by the fact that Min Chiel had never bullied him before. Despite Hyun Sung's role as class president and his tendency to intervene, he had maintained a certain boundary with Min Chiel, sparing himself from torment. Min Chiel resolved to leave Hyun Sung barely breathing at the end of the day's classes. Meanwhile, Min Ho sat in his own class, musing about Hyun Sung's behavior. He wondered if Hyun Sung was under the influence of drugs or something, given the inexplicable madness in his eyes. He inquired with a classmate if the incident had spread across the school, only to be met with a denial. Regardless of the cause, Han Sung now regarded them all with disdain. A fact now lost on Min Ho. He understood that letting the incident slide would diminish their standing in the eyes of the other students. Hence, even if they received the customary request, Min Ho resolved to crush Han Sung thoroughly, ensuring he could never meet their gazes with that same arrogance. Seated next to Min Ho, Chang Suk seethed with anger nursing a desire to end Hyun Sung's life. As the teacher exited the classroom, Min Chiel rose, his bruised face contorted in anger. Without a moment's hesitation, Hyun Sung's leg met Min Chiel's face with a forceful kick. Bewildered, Min Chiel felt his hair being seized by Hyun Sung, who seemed intent on continuing where they left off. It dawned on Min Chiel that the class president wasn't merely evading them. He was actively opposing them. Min Ho rose as his class concluded. The school, a confined arena, offered no sanctuary for Hyun Sung, there was no hiding place. Alongside Chang Shuk and the gang, he departed to confront Hyun Sung. Their path led to Min Chiel's classroom, where a crowd of students had gathered outside. The unfolding scene became clear to Min Ho, who hurried inside to assess the situation. Hyun Sung had seized Min Chiel by his vest, leaving him bloodied and bruised, unconscious. The delay was evident to Min Ho, realization dawning upon him. Chang Shuk charged at Hyun Sung, who had spent a decade in a vegetative state nurturing his thirst for revenge. His vengeance had been an oft-replayed narrative in his mind up until Park Min Chiel. However, a new challenge stood before him now, Kang Chang Suk. Overpowering Min Chiel had been simple, yet countering a behemoth like Chang Suk demanded unconventional methods, the very methods his previous self couldn't have fathomed. 
An open locker door lock became his weapon, a tool to bludgeon Chang Suk's face. Virtue and righteousness held no sway. Revenge justified any means. He clutched Chang Suk's hair, unrelenting as he struck him with a lock. Despite Chang Suk's robust physique, unyielding blows to his weak points took their toll, rendering him senseless. The gang members watched in terror as their mightiest comrade crumbled. Now Han Sung seized the moment, curling himself at Joe Yantek, the remaining gang member. He tackled Yantek with all his weight, knowing the ensuing struggle would overwhelm him. Floored in the hallway, Yantek was defenseless against Kyun Sum's barrage of punches. Han Sung welcomed Minho's potential attack from behind, all while relentlessly pummeling Yantek. Han Sung whittled down their numbers, diminishing the odds of being outnumbered. With a final blow, Yantek slumped, his resistance quelled. This was the combat Han Sung had mentally rehearsed endlessly. Yet, his stamina faltered, a plan perfectly formulated in his mind, undermined by his waning endurance. Just one more adversary remained. Minho stood quivering, confronting the reality of Han Sung's daunting strength. Previously, Minho considered him someone who could evade the top bully's attention. Now that perception crumbled. Han Sung loomed as a monstrous figure. Chang Shuk had been vanquished, leaving Minho bereft of strategies to contend with Han Sung. Han Sung advanced, poised to conclude the encounter. Trembling hands shielded Minho's face, the punch impending. Then, an unexpected intervention, the voice of reason, halting Han Sung's clenched fist. The hallway spectacle demanded attention, imperceptible to the school's oversight. Three bloodied students lay strewn, a harrowing tableau. Minho's smile, relief personified, salvation found through the teacher's intervention. The setting shifted to the teacher's office, where Han Sung was being reprimanded for his involvement in a scuffle with other kids. The students he had clashed with ended up in ambulances, their faces bloodied. At the very least, this could be classified as a case of school violence. In the worst-case scenario, the teacher might have to assume responsibility for the entire incident. He had no desire to be entangled in such a mess, so he aimed to shift all the blame onto Han Sung. Han Sung had always been well-behaved, which made his current behavior all the more bewildering. The teacher, addressing him sternly, conveyed that the repercussions of his actions would extend beyond the school premises. Drawing from his decades of experience in the education system, he stated that he had never encountered a student like Han Sung, someone so audacious and heedless of the consequences. Han Sung listened, his confusion deepening as the teacher urged him to prepare for the consequences. It was made clear that the parents of the injured students would not remain passive, they would demand retribution. In response, Han Sung attempted to downplay the situation, arguing that there was no need to make a spectacle out of the incident. He reminded the teacher that this was not the first instance of school violence he had dealt with. He implored the teacher to handle it discreetly, as he had done countless times before, rather than escalating it into a full-blown case. Han Sung even asked if the teacher could somehow cover up the whole affair, sparing him from the impending turmoil. However, his plea for leniency only fueled the teacher's rage. Frustration surged within him, and in a fit of anger, he struck Kyun Sung. Nearby teachers caught sight of this outburst. This turn of events was somewhat anticipated by Hyun Sung. After all, was the reason behind his previous demise. His death hadn't been solely the result of bullying, it was the culmination of the abuse and the apathetic stance of the adults who had stood idly by, merely observing. In particular, he vividly remembered Kim yong Chul, the head teacher of Class 1, and his facade of camaraderie with the teachers. Han Sung harbored a deep resentment towards them, regarding them as nothing more than worthless educators. In an attempt to defuse the situation, Han Sung pleaded with the teacher to cease his actions, but this only stoked the teacher's fury. Han Sung, undeterred, approached the teacher, his voice lowered as he made a veiled threat. He warned the teacher not to underestimate his resolve, hinting that he wouldn't remain silent about the teacher's financial improprieties involving parents' money, a secret he held over the teacher like a sword. Han Sung was well aware of the teacher's close connection to Minho's parents, a fact he could leverage to his advantage. Beyond the present incident, Han Sung had accumulated a trove of potential ammunition, including a scandal involving an English teacher. These were the reasons behind his audacious request for the teacher's silence. In the time before he fell into a coma, Han Sung had reached a pivotal decision after enduring relentless bullying. He recognized that his solution wasn't ideal, yet he believed that, at that moment, he needed the influence of an adult. Gathering his resolve, he sought out a teacher, aware that this choice wasn't without its flaws. Stepping into the office, he found the teacher seated, sipping coffee. To his dismay, Min Chiel and his gang were also present in front of the teacher. With a measured tone, the teacher turned to Min Chiel and inquired about the truth of Kan Sung's claims. Reluctantly, Min Chiel admitted that there was no valid reason for their mistreatment of their friends. He contended that their interactions had been mere jests, misconstrued by Kan Sung, due to his imposing physique. The conversation concluded swiftly, with the teacher resolving the matter by instructing the group to cease bullying their friend. 
the others departed the office, leaving behind a tense atmosphere. Minshul motioned for Hyunsum to follow him, ostensibly to share some information. Outside in the school yard, Minshul's fist struck Hyunsung's face, sending him stumbling to the ground. At that moment, a surge of anger and injustice welled up within Hyunsung. He pondered the responsibilities of an educator, who should have protected students reporting instances of bullying. The onslaught continued as Minshul's foot connected with Hyunsung's form repeatedly. Astonishingly, the teacher's gaze fell directly upon this scene, bearing witness to the brutality. Hyunsung clung to the belief that the teacher, having seen his suffering, would comprehend the gravity of the situation and take action. However, the teacher turned away, opting to ignore the unfolding violence. Time passed, and it was later revealed that Kim Young Chul, the teacher, had been receiving illicit payments from parents, including Minho's. This revelation shed light on the teacher's lack of intention to genuinely address the bullying issue. Hansung, post incident, dedicated himself to rectifying the situation, even if it meant doing it alone. Braving the harsh reality, he fought against the despair, his fists becoming instruments of resistance. On a particular day, Hansung crossed a line, resorting to violence by striking Minho in the face. Later, Minho's parents stormed into the school, seeking retribution for their son's injuries. In an area where Hansung's agency was limited, his grandmother offered an apology, acknowledging the realm of adult interventions as beyond his control. During the subsequent school violence inquiry, Hansung shouldered the blame alone, while Minshul's gang continued their untroubled school journey. Gradually, Hansung comprehended that brute strength alone wouldn't serve as a means of revenge. True retribution required the complete resolution facilitated by adult intervention. Fear painted the teacher's face as he confronted Hansung's revelations. In a hushed tone, Hansung cautioned the teacher to choose his words carefully before responding. He exposed the intricate web of connections. The introduction to Minho's parents through a university senior, the pre-existing care for Minho, and the monthly payment as a reward. Furthermore, he unveiled the teacher's affair with a married English teacher, a secret shared during their visits to Motel M. Yet, this sordid information only scratched the surface of the teacher's misdeeds. Hansung's implication was clear. Any attempt to dismiss his words would be met with the revelation of all secrets, potentially appending the teacher's future. Hansung's threat loomed large, promising to append the teacher's life, even if it meant forcing him to leave the school. As Hansung had ascended to his third year, the veil concealing Young Chol's personal affairs was lifted. Confronted by his wife, Young Chol's marriage crumbled under the weight of revealed infidelity, ending in divorce. It was rumored that his wife possessed significant wealth and assets. Sensing vulnerability, Hansung anticipated success in his blackmail. Young Chol, humbled, approached Hansung to inquire about his intentions. The plan laid out was simple to perpetuate the teacher's existing demeanor, an embodiment of his fallen state. He implored the teacher to remain a passive observer, to suppress students' transgressions despite knowing it was wrong. However, the focus shifted. These actions were to be carried out for Hyunsung's benefit, to shield him from repercussions, no matter the means employed. In return, Hansung pledged to guard Young Chul's secrets until his own graduation. Young Chul was just the initial pawn, a calculated move in a larger scheme. But before he could proceed, Hansung had unfinished business to address. Meanwhile, Minho's pent-up anger and frustration reached a boiling point. In a fit of rage, he wreaked havoc within the classroom, hurling furniture as a manifestation of his inner turmoil. His thoughts were fixated on the desire to obliterate Hansung upon his return. With an expectation that Young Chul's financial leverage would lead to Hansung's expulsion, Minho aimed to rid himself of his nemesis once and for all. Memories of the imminent punch instilled a fleeting fear. Yet Minho resolutely decided to transform into a predator, determined to maintain his dominant status and threw a chair across the classroom. He brushed off Hansung's victory over three opponents as a fluke, convinced of his impending triumph in their subsequent encounter. The classroom door swung open, revealing Hansung's figure, poised and unwavering, demanding resolution. Minho's eyes widened in terror as he confronted the unexpected confrontation. Swift as a lightning strike, Hansung's fist found its mark, striking Minho's face with precision. Minho collapsed onto the floor, dazed and bloodied. Approaching his fallen adversary, Hansung delivered a series of kicks, exacerbating Minho's injuries, crimson staining his lips. Through the window, young Chul's form loomed, a flicker of hope for assistance. But, alas, that hope vanished as the teacher averted his gaze, betraying Minho's expectation of aid. Yan Chul found himself seated in his cabin, quivering with fear after his recent encounter with Hansung. The situation seemed insurmountable, a case involving three students now hospitalized. The school was desperate to avoid any publicity, and not giving Hansung adequate punishment could enrage the parents, particularly Minho's parents. 
These affluent figures owned numerous buildings and held great renown in Dazen. Their benevolence extended to funding the school's repairs and maintenance, imparting them with undeniable influence, so much so that the principal personally attended to their concerns. The gravest predicament lay in Young Chul himself, he had received financial favors from them. If he chose to raise a fuss, his hands would be tied and his secrets revealed. He pondered fingers scratching his head in search of an idea, any solution. The best possible recourse appeared to be extricating Minho from the situation. Thus far, Hunsung had refrained from targeting Minho. Convincing Minho's parents might lead them to forgive the transgressions, chalking the injuries up to their son's ordinary friendships. There was a glimmer of hope in persuading Hunsung to spare Minho. Evading the worst outcome was still feasible. Swiftly, he dashed out, aiming to sway Hyunsung. Upon reaching the classroom, he discovered a bruised Minho. There was nothing that he could do now as the situation was not under his control. The urgency to pacify Minho's parents had waned. His concealed relationship with the English teacher took precedence now. Hyunsung relentlessly pummeled Minho, a cruel smirk adorning his face. The torment he endured for the past three years blamed on his perceived weakness, fueled this onslaught. Han Sung gripped Minho's visage, baffled that he was tormented by such a trembling figure. He abandoned Minho and settled into a corner, easing onto his seat. He did understand that sparing Minho could have facilitated the school's cover-up. Revenge enticed him to expose the others, if not, he wouldn't have struck Minchul the moment he returned. Eluding those individuals would have sufficed to ensure a peaceful existence. Having emerged from a vegetative patient's life, a burning desire for revenge consumed him. This was the outcome. With three students already hospitalized and one more awaiting a similar fate, the school's ambition to rise as a prestigious institution clashed with the principal's aspiration for a severe reprimand. Witnesses would prefer concealment. If Chunil High School failed to manage the situation, Han Sung's vengeance would remain a distant dream, it was merely the dawn of the tumult. In a meeting convened by the principal and attended by teachers, including Han Sung, the incident took center stage. Han Sung's actions went beyond hospitalizing his victims. Even though he got a consultation from his teacher, his brutality and lack of remorse were alarming. Savage violence against Minho escalated the severity. Principal Ogeyan's depiction likened the victim's appearances to those in gangster movies, ghastly. While English teacher Lee Min Young concurred with the principal, Young Chul intervened subtly, nudging her with his elbow. The discreet gesture underscored the need to shield their connection from getting exposed and to prevent Hyun Sung's expulsion. In front of all, Young Chul proclaimed Hyun Sung's culpability skillfully maneuvering the discussion. As Class 1's homeroom teacher, he placed the blame on Minchul and his cohorts. The rumor mill had painted Park Minchul and his gang as serial bullies. Young Chul intended to address the gang initially, but Kyun Sung's impulsive retaliation disrupted his plans. He pleaded that punishing Kyun Sung was not the way that the situation was supposed to be dealt with. The principal interjected, acknowledging the inevitability of punishment. He was aware that Minho's parents wouldn't be appeased easily. Placating their anger required appropriate action against the perpetrator. Power dynamics dictated his allegiance, fueling the school's pursuit of recognition. A disciplinary committee would convene in a week, deciding Hun Sung's fate. All present were implored to maintain discretion and avoid the rumors from spreading. Hun Sung faced suspension until the committee's ruling, instructed to reflect on his misdeeds during the interim, his guardian needed to be summoned a week later. Leaving the meeting, Hansung Sung was trailed by Young Chul. Young Chul beseeched Han Sung to curb his anger, emphasizing the irreparable problem posed by Minho's assault. He implored Han Sung to exercise restraint, allowing him time for a resolution. To Han Sung, Young Chul appeared intriguing. A figure transformed. The same teacher who had slapped him and scorned him had morphed into an ally adaptable to circumstances. He had already considered Young Chul as a trash who had given up his consciousness as a teacher a long time back. Han Sung recognized Yun Chol's propensity to act in his best interest. The teacher remained oblivious to his own potential to resolve this conundrum. Once more, Han Sung reprimanded Yun Chol for being privy to Minchul's bullying, issuing a stern warning. Yun Chol was to keep silent until Han Sung's graduation. Optimal outcomes hinged on prioritizing Han Sung, a course that safeguarded not only his life but also Li Min Young's life from ruin. Stepping away, Han Sung's heart churned with fury, yearning to dismantle Yun Chol. Yet, this wasn't his primary objective. Temporary rage wouldn't allow him to discard a valuable asset. He understood that this card held utility, fortifying his foothold within the school. Despite Young Chul's role as a mere teacher, survival instincts propelled him to serve any purpose. He picked up his bag and started to go home. After the week concluded, Kanan Sung's meticulously devised plan would unfurl, promising upheaval beyond the principal's expectations. Kanan Sung had made his way back home safely, walking alone. His only possession was a shabby villa, 
marked with the number 00, which had a prize value of 50 million won. Without the insurance money from his parents' death, he would have been solely reliant on his monthly salary. Back when his grandmother had to move in due to mounting hospital bills, it felt as if the world had crumbled around him. Although he had always seen the place as rundown since childhood, he now found himself grateful for having a place to return to. Entering the house, he called out for his grandmother, recalling that she used to be at work around this time. He reminded himself that sentimentality had no place. Every action he took was for the sake of their family. The opportunity for his revenge was a miraculous chance, one he was unswervingly committed to. He even harbored a hope to secure a comfortable dwelling for his grandmother and Kayanjin. The deliberation committee meeting was only a week away, and he was determined to execute his next plan flawlessly. Over the next two years, he had devised a plan to expand his influence in the surrounding areas, establish a foundation, and dismantle the power bases of those he opposed. To achieve this, he recognized three pivotal conditions. The first entailed having sufficient personal strength to confront these violent wrongdoers head-on. He knew he couldn't achieve this through mere self-training. Rather, he needed to align himself with a person who could offer a substantial advantage in future confrontations. The second condition mirrored the first, revolving around amassing like-minded individuals. His adversaries were gathering formidable forces, necessitating his own alliance of purpose-driven people. He recognized the instrumental role individuals played. Despite being a high school freshman, he aspired to take the lead in recruiting those essential to his cause. And then there was the third and most crucial condition, a challenge he had anticipated and aimed to surmount. He required a solid foundation to set his plans in motion, to ensure no obstacles hindered his path. The scene shifted to a man, his voice echoing through a police station as he bellowed at the top of his lungs. Towering and robust, his hair had turned a shade of gray. He boasted of his lineage and warned that anyone ignorant of his identity, despite being a dazed citizen, was branded a spy. He cast threats upon the police officer, asserting they wouldn't remain safe after treating him in such a manner. This 35-year-old man, Go Chambo, was the eldest son of Mayanjin Construction, a name notorious in Dazen. The police were well aware of his potential to wreak havoc and were treading carefully, especially since the family was embroiled in the race for succession. With the succession race underway, the family's actions were measured and cautious. Chang Bohm sat patiently, accused of being the instigator in an altercation. Contrary to the officer's perspective, he refuted the allegations attributing the injuries suffered by the other party to their frailty. Any mishandling of this situation would undoubtedly be exploited by his opponents. His father had recently declared the commencement of the succession race between him and his younger brother, who held a prestigious university degree and a strong social position due to a well-advantaged marriage. Chang Bohm's prospects would crumble if news of his involvement in the violence case reached his brother. The police officer leveled the blame at him, accusing him of assaulting innocent individuals. Chang Bohm argued that he had been attacked first, though without CCTV footage or concrete evidence, his claims wavered. It was challenging to counter the testimony of the victims. Amidst this, a young boy sat in the station. Han Sung had come forward to vouch for Chang Bohm. Presenting footage to the officer, he substantiated Chang Bohm's assertion. Those bystanders had initiated the altercation. The evidence was clear. Those bystanders had repeatedly confronted Chang Bohm as he quietly passed by. Han Sung asserted that he had stumbled upon the incident and noticed there were no CCTV cameras. So he had procured the black box video from a nearby parked car and offered his testimony recognizing that his status as a minor might render his words less convincing. Han Sun maintained that the incident was an act of self-defense. Chang Bohm, grateful for the intervention, draped his arm around Han Sun's shoulders. With proof and a witness, his position seemed secure. The police concluded their investigation, planning to arrange a meeting once the injured parties were treated. Han Sun and Chang Bohm left the police station together, the latter expressing his gratitude for the assistance he had received. Chang Bohm was a man who never forgot a favor, he extended a monetary token of his appreciation to Hansung, who accepted it without hesitation. This response intrigued Chang Bohm. Most students his age would hesitate to accept a large sum of money. Moreover, the fact that Hansung had also provided the black box video piqued his curiosity. Asking Hansung why he had helped, Chang Bohm found himself in an unexpected conversation. Hansung, in a tone of curiosity, questioned whether Chang Bohm believed the incident was a mere accident. Hansung explained that he was aware of Chang Bohm's reputation and his current involvement in the succession race against his brother. He shared his own belief that the incident was accidental, substantiating it with the fact that he had proof. Go Chang Bohm held a prominent position in Dazen, a figure whose actions and family matters had been etched into Kyun Sung's memory over time. From their rise to their current state, their story was a thread woven through Kyun Sung's consciousness, a narrative he had absorbed during his coma. 
He requested an hour of Chambom's time, acknowledging that his inquiry delved into a realm that could potentially impact Chambom's life profoundly. Kansung and Chambon were seated in a cafe engaging in a discussion about pressing matters. The original copy of the black box was presented by Hyunsung to Chambon. In an attempt to demonstrate self-defense, Hyunsung chose to reveal only the latter half of the video, withholding the initial portion from the police. The section he revealed was intended to establish the occurrence of an incident. Thirty minutes preceding the incident, three men congregated in front of the convenience store. At first glance, they might have appeared as regular customers merely utilizing the store's services. However, the peculiarity arose from their unwavering posture even after the lapse of half an hour. They seemed to linger in anticipation of someone's arrival. The moment Chang Mom appeared, they initiated a brawl in a blatant manner, almost as if they were inviting confrontation. These men pushed their faces forward, hurling curses. Despite Chang Mom's efforts to maintain his composure, he eventually succumbed to the provocation and threw the first punch. With a sigh, Hansung set his coffee cup on the table, continuing his narrative. Even Changbo must have harbored suspicions regarding the recent series of incidents, seemingly orchestrated right at the onset of the successor race. The prospect of Changsook orchestrating events to undermine Changbo was unveiled. Whether it occurred by chance or design, the gravity of the situation varied significantly. Changbo might have entertained doubts, but the idea that his younger brother, who had grown up so well, could stoop to such nefarious deeds was a bitter pill to swallow. At present, Myeongjin construction held recognition primarily in rural areas. However, leveraging their substantial capital and technological prowess, they were poised to excel in apartment construction. Thanks to the philosophy of Chairman Go Myeongjin, who advocated prudence in matters concerning people's dwellings, profit margins were minimized, completion rates soared, ultimately propelling Myeongjin construction into the echelons of corporate giants. Regrettably, both sons vanished during this journey. Chang Sok stood at the epicenter of this predicament. Not long after, an incident of seismic proportions rattled Dazen, permeating even Han Sun's awareness despite his own experiences of school violence. Chang Shuk had aspired to inherit the mantle of succession, resorting to a litany of misdeeds that eventually came to light before his elder brother, Chang Bom. The eruption of rage culminated in Chang Bom landing a punch on his younger sibling, an act that left Chang Shuk permanently disabled. Fueled by fury, Chairman Myeongjin declared both his sons unfit to inherit Myeongjin construction, causing a major upheaval. The ensuing frenzy led to the exposure of the brothers' activities, attaining meme-worthy status on the internet. This turn of events allowed Hansung to retrace his memory's path and pinpoint that specific location. In response, Chairman Myeongjin recruited a professional manager, leading Myeongjin construction into the ranks of conglomerates. Even Hansung agreed that preserving the status quo would serve Myeongjin construction's best interests in the long run. The elder son, Changbon, while not malicious enough to eliminate his competition, was incompetent and prone to unsavory outbursts. On the other hand, the second son, Chang Suk, exhibited a ruthless determination to advance his own interests, disregarding moral constraints. It seemed fitting for Myeongjin construction to distance itself from both sides. Nevertheless, such matters held little significance for Hyunsung. For him, their utility and his plans took precedence. He remained unconcerned about the potential butterfly effect resulting from altering the future. Even if his choices led to an unfavorable transformation, they bore no relevance to his pursuit of vengeance, the paramount objective of his existence. Hansung extended an offer to Changbom, proposing a collaboration to exact revenge on Changshuk and ensure the eldest son's ascent to the chairmanship of Meomjun Construction. Changbom, skeptical about the potential assistance a mere high schooler could offer, was met with Hansung's unwavering conviction. He emphasized that while Chang Mom was surrounded by individuals who whispered sweet nothings, he, a mere teenager, had managed to decipher Chang Suk's intricate scheme. Han Sung sought to establish a foundation of trust in their burgeoning relationship. Exiting the cafe, Chang Bom stepped out into the open air and lit a cigarette. His life had been one of careless indulgence, a privilege bestowed upon him as the firstborn of the Myeongjin construction dynasty. Renowned as a veritable time bomb in the realm of Daesun, he had garnered a reputation that cautioned against provoking his temper. However, it wasn't due to inherent righteousness that Hansung had approached him. Rather, it was his latent cunning, a quality that could dismantle his own brother's aspirations in the pursuit of power. This calculated demeanor had led Hansung to identify Chang Bom as the prime candidate for his intricate plan. Reflecting on the situation, Chang Bom regretted his brother's lack of subtlety, realizing that moderation could have served his purpose better. Reluctantly, Chang Bom agreed to Hansung's proposal, acknowledging that compared to Chang Suk, he possessed little. The current trajectory hinted at Chang Bo's impending powerlessness in retaining the succession position. 
However, amid his uncertainty, he grappled with the decision of entrusting a 17-year-old whom he had met for the first time in his life. Memories of his father's counsel echoed in his mind, advising him to align with those possessing skills, irrespective of age, gender, or circumstance. This strategy, he was told, would secure his leadership of Meonjin construction. The quandary deepened further confusing Chambon's resolution. Returning to Kunsun, Chambon expressed his willingness to wait his decision following the presentation of the plan. Meanwhile, Chang Sok's agitated conversation over the phone culminated in his phone being hurled aside. He grappled with the frustration of a plan gone awry. The blame fell upon his father, whose traditional perspective on the eldest brother receiving the throne had triggered the ordeal. Nevertheless, Chang Sok found solace in retaining a crucial advantage. His train of thought, however, was abruptly derailed by an incoming call. A significant incident had transpired, someone had forcibly entered Han Sun office tell. Han Sun embarked on an explanation to Chang Bom, elucidating that comprehending reality was paramount to securing victory in the succession race. When juxtaposed with Chang Suk, it became evident that the position of Myeongjin Construction's chairman suited him better. While Chang Bom had barely scraped through high school, Chang Suk had pursued business administration at a prestigious foreign university. Upon returning, he had even married into a reputable family. Chang Shuk had meticulously devised a strategy for his recruits to impartially determine the successor, thus establishing a formal framework for succession. Han Sun continued revealing that happenstance had played no role from the outset. Chang Shuk had meticulously orchestrated events to rest his brother's position, thereby positioning himself advantageously. Beyond the mere distinction of being the elder brother, Chang Bom paled in comparison to Chang Suk on every count. Despite the litany of cases and incidents, Chang Bom's prospects of triumph seemed meager. Yet, amidst these disparities, Han Sun perceived a glimmer of potential for Chang Bom. Even though Chang Suk appeared the more favorable contender, there existed one critical reason for the chairman's consideration. The naive belief that the eldest son would cling to the aspiration of succession. Han Sun presented an alternative perspective. What if Chang Suk, despite his advantages, were to plummet to Chang Bom's level? This marked the commencement of a competition, an arena where they would stand on equal footing against their opponents. At such a juncture, the age-old hierarchy of the eldest son would bear little significance given the balance they could potentially achieve. Han Sung and Chang Bom's ongoing conversation was underscored by an air of seriousness. Han Sung was in the process of advising Chang Bom about the three conditions that were imperative for victory in the successor competition. Regrettably, Chang Bom had already fallen short in terms of the first condition, background. Unlike his younger brother, who was strategically aligning himself with a prestigious family to gain support, Chang Bom had been preoccupied with frivolous nights spent in clubs and cultivating friendships of a transient nature. The second condition, reputation, cast a long shadow over Chang Bom's chances. His moniker as Dazen's crazy bastard had woven a narrative of notoriety, and not in a favorable way. This unsavory reputation seemed irremovable. Then came the final condition, ability, which underscored the divergence between the two brothers. While Chang Bom's endeavors involved socializing with women and indulging in excessive drinking, Chang Sok was garnering recognition for his adeptness in administrative tasks. Chang Sok's path through the competition had been smoother, not necessitating overt displays of excellence. Even if his abilities were deemed merely all right, they still outshone Chang Bong's lackadaisical approach. Han Sung formulated a strategic plan that revolved around methodically overturning these three pivotal conditions one by one. Returning to the initial criterion of background, he sought Chang Bong's input on how they could ascend to a superior position in this particular aspect. However, the option of marrying into a prestigious family akin to his brothers was precluded. Such an opportunity was not just around the corner. Their path to rectification lay in a different direction, Chang Suk and his wife's separation. By removing this factor, Chang Suk's progression would be halted, compelling him to return to the starting line where equity prevailed. The scene shifted to Chairman Myeonjin's office, where a dialogue unfolded between him and his sons. Myeonjin relayed his interaction with Chang Suk's father-in-law concerning his marital discord. Myeonjin had earnestly implored the in-laws for a chance of redemption for his son. Their stipulation was for Chang Suk and his wife to live apart immediately, thereby initiating a process of atonement. The in-laws' verdict hung in the balance contingent upon Chang Suk's contrition. Myeonjin recollected admonishing Chang Suk to adhere to principles of loyalty or, alternatively, to have abstained from matrimony like Chang Bom in the first place. Chang Bong's recent encounters with law enforcement did not escape Myeonjin's attention, and this matter was broached during her conversation. Anticipating an outburst, Myeonjin inquired about the police involvement. Chang Bong perceived Kun Sun's approach as a promising avenue. His plan crystallized into exposing Chang Suk's vulnerabilities and presenting them to his father. 
In his view, this revelation would spark his father's disenchantment with Changsuk. Hansan, however, recognized the fallacy of this approach. During his vegetative state, he had absorbed a documentary on Myeonjin's life. This exposed a highlight that Myeonjin had cognizance of both his son's machinations, even delving into Changsuk's machinations against his elder sibling. The former chairman's strategy was one of non-interference, implying that multiple paths were viable. It became evident that Myeonjin's selection criteria for a successor did not singularly emphasize an unblemished background. While their lives might bear untidiness, the capacity to propel the company forward held paramount importance. Thus, divulging Changsuk's transgressions could inadvertently steer the helm toward an outsider, a professional manager. Han Sung discerned the need for Changbone to demonstrate traits befitting a chairman irrespective of a checkered past. Changbone's demeanor demanded transformation as he recognized that embracing responsibility was the hallmark of a leader. Apologizing to his father and pledging to a future bereft of such incidents, Changbom undertook to shoulder accountability as the elder son. He vowed to resume his duties with gravitas, even reprimanding Chang Sub for his missteps. The strategy was set in motion and orchestrated with meticulousness. Myeonjin commended Changbom's composure, acknowledging his conduct during a recent altercation. The fatherly pride conveyed in that moment was a novelty, an elation that left Changbom trembling with an unfamiliar happiness. Henceforth, Changbom aspired to more instances of paternal commendation. Behind the wheel of a car, Changbone steered while Hyunsun occupied the passenger seat. A narrative of Changbone's ascent to his father's good graces was recounted, underscored by the subtle undertones of shifting dynamics. Changbone's intention was clear, to grasp the nuances of his newfound recognition and apply them in his quest to attain the chairman's seat. He sought Hyunsun's guidance and committed to unwavering adherence. Hyunsun, in response, tempered Changbone's enthusiasm. He underscored that Chang Suk's status was now comparable to theirs exclusively concerning background. To secure the chairmanship, Chang Bone was tasked with prevailing over Chang Suk in the remaining two conditions. Han Sung outlined a blueprint for Chang Bone, a blueprint laden with challenges. The crux of this plan involved immersing himself within the company's operations and assimilating management intricacies. The timing was critical. Han Sung would reveal the subsequent steps when deemed appropriate. Chang Bone inquired whether he was destined for a role as an office employee. Swiftly, he aligned himself with Hyun Sung's strategy and alliance forged on mutual expectations. For his invaluable assistance, Hyun Sung anticipated reciprocation in kind from Changbom. The scene transposed to the day of the deliberation committee hearing, a focal point of intense emotions. Kim Soonja, the mother of Jung Minho, took center stage with a forceful slap directed at Yun Chul. The context was imbued with indignation, stemming from dissatisfaction despite substantial monetary contributions. An ultimate was delivered job security in exchange for ousting the student who had dared to lay a hand on her son. Faced with this dilemma, Young Chul's vulnerability was palpable. An interaction ensued between Young Chul and Hyunsung, characterized by an undercurrent of tension. Young Chul's plea was for Hyunsung to plead guilty, thereby warranting a reduced punishment. This appeal was underpinned by a realization that resistance would not bend the course of events. Hyunsung, in turn, offered sagacious advice. He urged Young Chol to weigh his options carefully, even when cognizant of the shadow of blackmail cast by Minho's mother. Young Chol stood at a crossroads of two options, getting exposed for taking bribes or exposing his infidelity to his wife. The hearing commenced, pivoting around the homeroom teacher's obligation to elucidate the events at hand. Young Chol rose promptly, asserting the clarity of the case. He contended that the entire situation had crystallized due to Minho's actions, compounded by his peers' bullying of an innocent student. The victim's portrayal as the aggressor was emblematic of a grave miscarriage of justice, an act that outraged sensibilities. In the meeting, the guy that Yun Chol had seen at the adult entertainment establishment previously caught his attention. He came to realize that Kim Hyun Sung's guardian was the eldest son of Myeongjim Construction, named Chang Bom. Unlike Minho's parents, Chang Bom held an even more prominent position in society. This situation offered a potential avenue for his redemption. Seizing this moment, which was known only to him, where Han Sung's guardian was Chang Bom, Young Chol stepped forward. He presented to the board a different narrative, describing the incident as a grave crime where the roles of the perpetrator and the victim were reversed. Confusion shattered the principal's face as he listened to Young Chol's words. Seeking clarity, he requested Young Chol to provide a detailed account of the incident, ensuring no room for misunderstanding. Young Chol revealed that he had received multiple complaints about a group of four students, often referred to as Park Mitchell's gang. These students had been engaged in bullying their peers since the start of the semester. He admitted to having sternly warned the gang to cease their disruptive behavior. However, with the passage of time, their actions had escalated. A few days before, Minchil had subjected Lee Jung-min to his usual bullying tactics. 
Unable to stand by any longer, Hansung, driven by his sincere and youthful heart, intervened to stop the bullying. In response, Park ming rallied his friends and attempted to coerce Hansung. Young Shul passionately argued that when harm was being inflicted, standing idly by was not an option. He contended that Hansung's actions were an act of self-defense. Young Chul urged the board to consider that Minchul's informant Minho had instigated a group assault. Faced with this aggression, Hansung had been forced to react in an unexpected manner. While admitting that Hansung's response was forceful, Young Chul implored the board not to disregard the context of the case and the relationships involved. He warned that excessive punishment overlooking the nuances could lead to a dismissal of the essence of school violence, much like how adults often overlook its core. The principal found himself perplexed by Yang Chol's interpretation of the events. He emphasized the gravity of the incident, branding it as a heinous act that had resulted in four students being hospitalized for the first time in Chianel High's history. The principal maintained that the question of who instigated the violence was a separate matter from the discussion. In his eyes, violence could never be justified, regardless of the reasons. He expressed his personal struggle in having to pass judgment on right and wrong, asserting that stringent punishment was necessary to prevent such incidents from recurring. The principal's focus shifted to Minho, as he believed that hearing the victim's account would shed light on the truth. Minho, addressing the board, countered Young Chol's version of events. According to Minho, his experience drastically differed from Young Chol's portrayal. He recounted entering the classroom to find Hansung aggressively attacking Minchul. Seeking insight from his friends, Minho learned that Hansung, typically unassuming, had initiated the assault without provocation. Minho argued that the board should consider seeking testimony from another witness, as it was evident to him that Hansung had triggered the violence. Emotion tinged Minho's voice as he continued, describing how he had been unable to stand by and watch his friends suffer. Rushing to intervene, he found Hansung wielding a lock as a weapon. While Minho speculated that Hansung might have felt threatened by the gathering crowd, the immediate concern was Minchul's battered state. Minho expressed bewilderment at the teacher's attempt to shift blame onto them, given that he himself had tried to discipline Hansung previously. To Minho, it seemed that Hansung, irritated by the teacher's call to the office, had unleashed a merciless assault upon him in front of their peers. Overcome with emotion, Minho's mother rose to her feet, demanding that the board look at her son's bruised face, a face she had cared for so tenderly. To her, the school had become a breeding ground for brutal violence. In the hospital, Minchul's gang deliberated on the ongoing meeting. They speculated about Minho's mother, anticipating her ferocity and her potential to upend the school's environment. Surprisingly, Minchul did not advocate for Hyunsung's expulsion. Rather, he harbored a desire to subject Hyunsung to relentless bullying until he begged to withdraw from school. Minchul vowed that even if Hyunsung were to be expelled, he would relentlessly pursue him, demanding reparation. Several hundred bucks per person, at the very least. Growing impatient with the unfolding events, Changbom interjected. He challenged the board, questioning whether their ignorance was genuine or a facade. He did not mince his words as he labeled Minho a demon camouflaged in human skin, insinuating that Minho might have sparked the incident. Both the principal and Minho's mother bristled at the depiction of Minho as a demon. Changbone divulged that he had independently investigated Minchul's gang, discovering their record of assaults, thefts, and extortion. This notoriety had elevated them to a point of infamy. He confronted the board's selective acknowledgement, hinting at a potential financial connection. The once confident Minchul's gang now faltered as the weight of Changbom's words pressed upon them. All the turmoil had unfurled because Hansung had tried to defend himself. In a display of solidarity, Changbom threw his support behind the homeroom teacher, urging the board to uncover the genuine nature of the incident. However, Minho's mother, unable to bear hearing her son being denounced, challenged Changbom's understanding, reminding him that Hansung was an orphan. Asking Changbom for a favor, Hansung had sought him out as a sponsor. Chainbone had nonchalantly advised Hansung to request money when needed. Hansung's motivations, though, were deeper. He required Chainbone's substantial resources for his ambitious future plans. Yet he recognized that merely needing money could have led him to simpler avenues like stocks or real estate. To vanquish adversaries of considerable influence, he had to match their resources, particularly in terms of power. Thus, Hansung had candidly laid out his intentions to Chainbone. A future marked by calculated disruption within the school, incidents that could snowball into legal troubles. Through these trials, he intended for Chambone to stand as his pillar of support, resolving all issues. By doing so, he envisioned a scenario where none in Dazen would dare challenge him, and he pledged to elevate Chambone to even higher heights, potentially making him the chairman of Myanju Construction. Chambone's commitment would, in turn, usher him into a realm beyond. Chambone assured Kyunsan that he wielded mastery over influence urging Hansung to place his trust in him. He posited that any form of turmoil, 
be it brawls or controversies, could be managed. In the boardroom, Chang Mo's voice reverberated with authority as he declared himself Han Sung's sponsor and the eldest son of Meonjin Construction. Chang Mo referred to Kun Sung as a beloved younger brother of his and had awareness that Kun Sung was of the kind to stir up trouble. Nevertheless, Han Sung found himself summoned to a deliberation committee hearing, prompting him to rush over and set aside his other responsibilities. Kunal High was esteemed in Dazen known as a prestigious school. Dazen's reputation was something that Chang Bom cherished, and he had plans to foster the school's growth under the banner of Myeonjin construction. However, recent revelations about the school's internal decay gave him pause. The notion of an educator installing righteous and just values in students had been violated as evidenced by Han Sum's ordeal. Han Sum had once stood up against bullies to defend a fellow classmate, an act that resulted in his punishment. Astonishingly, the school intended to disregard the years of bullying Han Sung endured and instead penalize him for finally defending himself, albeit somewhat forcefully. The circumstances under which he was assaulted lacked any clarifications or discussions. The question hung heavy. Why had Chunal Hai turned a blind eye to the torment Han Sung suffered? Chang Bom vowed that if the school's indifference arose from Han Sung's humble background, or if the parents of the bullies had smoothed things over with money, he would not let the matter rest. He pledged to upend Dazen's prestigious image, going so far as to declare that neither the bullies nor their supporters would ever set foot in Dazen again. He acknowledged that the board might perceive his words as a threat, but he regarded it as true justice. The principal grappled with his thoughts, his inner turmoil profound. He was aware that siding with Minho, the firstborn son of Myeonjin construction, would sever any chance of affiliating with the powerful Myeonjin conglomerate. Should he dare oppose Myeonjin, he might well face expulsion from Dazen, Contemplating the possibility of severing ties with Minho, he saw a window to curry favor with Myeonjin. To secure Myeonjin's sponsorship could pave the way for Chinul Hai's ascent to the nation's premier school. His decision would come at a personal cost, labeled a turncoat and subjected to criticism, he chose to prioritize the school's future. With reluctant concession, he relayed to the board that he had become aware of an ongoing bullying situation since the start of the school year. The alleged ringleader was Jung Minho, based on the information available. The principal asserted that his intent wasn't to shift blame but to present the facts as they were known. He acknowledged Kim Sung's academic excellence, implying that there must be a valid reason behind his actions and urging all to hear Hun Sung's perspective. Finally, the deliberation turned to Kim Sung's side of the story. At times when he lacked advocates, his voice had been unheard. He reflected on the significance of being listened to, a stark contrast to his prior existence where a lack of support led to a tragic end. He began recounting his narrative, a tale of repeatedly reporting Minchul's roots' violent activities to numerous teachers. Regrettably, each time he approached the educators, the responses were dishearteningly consistent, downplaying the severity or dismissing it as mere playfulness. While promises of investigation were made, they were superficial and yielded no substantial action. This emboldened the bullies and deepened the lack of accountability. He openly admitted to confronting Minchul's gang and resorting to violence that led to their hospitalization. Paradoxically, despite being the target of the bully's aggression and his own defensive actions, he was being forced to alone face consequences, a result of perceived powerlessness in the eyes of adults. Han Sung recognized that power was the pivotal difference. Even enduring violence or near death from rooftop falls required some measure of influence. The harsh reality was that there existed one law for the wealthy and another for the impoverished. Han Sung sought to exploit this immutable truth to its fullest. He demanded the board address the rampant bullying and punish the culprits or face the consequences of the incident being exposed beyond the school's confines. His threat loomed large, poised to tarnish Chino Hai's image and its association with Dazen. Amidst the proceedings, Minho's mother erupted in agitation, vehemently opposing the prospect of her son being held accountable. Seeking support, she retreated to a corner to call her husband. She painted a picture of the deliberation committee conspiring against her son implicating the inclusion of even teacher Yang Chol and Principal Da Wan. Han Sung's affiliation with the Myeonjin hair was highlighted. Urgently, she implored her husband to intervene to demonstrate their family's standing. Her husband's response was terse yet commanding for the sake of their family's survival. She must desist and let their son face the consequences. That night, Han Sung found himself assigned 100 hours of volunteer work in exchange for his act of violence, while the four students responsible were expelled. In a surge of anger, Minho charged at Kyunsung, aggression in his eyes outside the meeting room. Minho's mother intervened, restraining her son. Seizing the moment, Kyunsung advised Minho to kneel and beg for forgiveness. Minho's expulsion ignited his resistance, but Kyunsung's whispered counsel urged him to appease the situation and possibly salvage his fate. Minho's mother issued a commanding directive, 
compelling her son to kneel and plead for absolution. The scene bore a semblance to a previous memory, where Hansung's own grandfather had knelt and beseeched Minho's mother for forgiveness. Yet Hansung's heart remained unsatisfied. He demanded more, instructing Minho to start praying, a plea to shape Minho's future with adversity. This marked the culmination of the deliberation committee's session, propelling Hansung one step closer to confronting the mastermind behind the orchestrated campaign to drive him to his demise. Later, a message from Minchul beckoned, hinting at a meeting to come. In the quiet of the late night, Minchul and Hansung found themselves meeting up. Gratitude filled Minchul's voice as he thanked Hansung for agreeing to this meeting. Taking a deep breath, he began to confess, admitting that the bullying and the attempted aggression towards Hansung were entirely his own fault. He owned up to his lack of maturity at the time, realizing now the pain he must have inflicted upon others. He recounted the week spent in the hospital and how he had come to terms with the verdict from the deliberation committee. The experience had been a wake-up call, and he promised to steer clear of such actions in the future. He implored Hansung, his voice quivering with sincerity, to find it in his heart to forgive him this once. Minchul's desperation was palpable as he continued, speaking about their potential expulsion that could shatter their lives irreparably. He pleaded with Hansung, the plea laden with a promise to fulfill any requests Hansung might make in the future, whether that be running errands or being a loyal companion. Hansung, lost in his thoughts, understood the weight of expulsion and the implications it held for all of them. He recognized that despite the gang's predatory behavior, they were still just 17-year-olds with turbulent lives. Their futures would be forever tainted if they were expelled for such a reason. Minchul's admission of a hidden truth caught Hansung's attention. There had been an instigator behind the scenes orchestrating the bullying. This revelation intrigued Hansung, but he was already aware of that fact. In the years that had passed, Hansung had fallen into a coma, and a tragic incident unfolded. A fellow student, tormented like Hansung had been, had taken his own life by leaping off the rooftop. The suicide note had laid bare a shocking truth. An enigmatic organization known as the Golden Circle had its roots in esteemed Gangnam schools, its core members remaining elusive even in the face of future revelations. The organization had preyed on students suffering from bullying, seeing it as a profitable venture. The founder had recruited bullies and those of considerable strength, manipulating them to target students with influential parents. In exchange, the protected students would excel academically. If a member's rank dwindled due to another student, the recruited bullies would intervene, ensuring the hierarchy remained intact. Despite a brief unveiling of the Golden Circle's core members, the case had quickly faded from public attention, the true identities of those involved remaining a closely guarded secret. Han Sung's determination was set ablaze as he yearned for retribution against those who had condemned him to hell. The Golden Circle had to be exposed and dismantled to fulfill his revenge. Amidst this turmoil, one aspect perplexed him. The Golden Circle's reach was centered in Seul and Dayan Yigu, casting doubt on how they had influenced Minchul in the town of Dazen. The revelation came with the name, Shin Yangmin, a formidable figure, a third-year senior in their school, feared and powerful. Hansung realized that Shin was possibly connected to the Golden Circle, although the mechanics were unclear. Shin's physical prowess was daunting to the extent that he could become a professional MMA athlete. Overwhelmed with decisions, Hansung knew he had to first address the situation with Minchul. Frustration and unresolved emotions simmered within Hansung as he confronted Minchul. He couldn't grant immediate forgiveness or absolution. Grasping Minchul's shirt, his grip and manifestation of pent-up emotions, Hansung laid down his intentions. Every future encounter would be a testament to the pain he had endured. A punch landed on Minchul's already bruised face, a physical expression of the torment Hansung had suffered. In his past life, Minchul had become a detached father estranged from his own daughter. Similar fates had befallen the others as well, their lives thriving despite the harm they had caused Hansung. Though to sense of poetic justice, a desire for them to suffer the enduring trauma Hansung had known. News of the incident rippled through the school, whispers of Hansung's ruthless retaliation against the gang of bullies. Quietly, he entered his classroom, seeking solace near a window. Amidst the hush atmosphere, Jung Min approached him with gratitude, acknowledging the expulsion of Minho and the others, and appreciating Hansung's actions. A promise of unwavering support hung in the air offered by Jung Min. The class watched in silence, taking in this unexpected interaction. With a mix of confusion and bitterness, Hansung questioned Jung Min's sudden change of heart, a stark contrast to his earlier reluctance during the hearing. Pushing Jung Min away, Hansung's demeanor made it clear he wanted nothing to do with him. Meanwhile, on the school rooftop, a conversation unfolded between two young men. One, tall and lean with white hair, flicked a cigarette to the ground in frustration. Shin Yang Min, a senior from Chinol High School, contemplated his next moves now that Minchul's gang had been expelled. 
Their attempt to intimidate Hunsum had backfired spectacularly when they realized he was protected by the might of Myonjin Construction's first son. This reality had rendered Hunsung untouchable in Dazen, the fact that Shin saw as an opportunity rather than a setback. He discussed the potential for financial gain with his companion, recognizing the lucrative potential of managing such situations. He mentioned their need to be thankful for this new opening, a chance to capitalize on unfortunate circumstances. As his thoughts solidified, he instructed his companion to summon the head of the freshman, precursor to their unfolding plans. Back in the classroom, Hunsung's mind churned with calculated thoughts of revenge. The path forward demanded academic excellence, a way to dismantle the Golden Circle's grip on those who outperformed their own members. His dedication to achieving top grades was a strategic move, forcing the Golden Circle's hand. He conjectured that he might have been a thorn in the side of at least one member due to his impressive performance in middle school. The revelation that Minchul and his gang were manipulated into targeting him encouraged his thoughts. The true perpetrator lurked within the school's walls, the one seeking to supplant him. A list of suspects formed in Hensung's mind though he knew that acting without concrete evidence would be unwise. Preparation was his ally against the trials he anticipated in the days ahead. Jum Duccio, once a celebrated MMA fighter and the UFL world champion, was now a remnant of the past that no one cared about anymore. As Hunsum entered the registration area, a tinge of disappointment accompanied him. A sense of humility and a desire to master the art of combat led him to this place. It was a missing piece he needed to complete himself. Part Jinwu a first-year student at Chino High School was summoned to the school's rooftop at the command of Shin. Jinwoo's physique garnered appreciation from Shin as he made a request. Shin instructed Jinwoo to transform a fellow first-year student, Hansung, into a state where he could no longer function as a normal human being. Hansung entered the gym's reception with the intention of learning how to fight. He encountered a man in a blue jacket, considerably older than himself. The man's joy was evident as he welcomed Hansung, a high schooler, to the right place. He delved into the gym's various offerings, including physical education preparation, stress relief, and dietary improvement, all backed by a guaranteed 100% customer satisfaction. The man before Hyunsung was none other than Joan Duchiel, the director of Joan Duchiel Gym. Hyunsung found it difficult to recognize the former UFO champion due to his mustache. Hyunsung's drive for joining the gym stemmed from his desire to learn how to fight to the extent of overpowering his tormentors. Dukyul enlightened Hansum that the gym was not a fighting dojo, he emphasized that strengthening one's body was key to preventing bullying. Hansung comprehended that there was a deeper reason for Dukyul's choice of running a small gym in the countryside, rather than capitalizing on his fame. Following Dukyul's third title defense in the UFL, he underwent a doping test, which detected the presence of anabolic steroids temporarily enhancing muscle strength. Dukyul candidly admitted his mistake without offering excuses, resulting in an abrupt end to his career. Although this episode wasn't directly related to Hyunsung, his focus shifted to Duchil's other skill. During a period of coma, Hansung caught wind of the news regarding Kim Myol, a Korean athlete who had reached the UFL title fight for the second time. Myol had remarkably ascended the ranks in a few short years after his debut, attributing his success to his mentor, director Duchil's unique teaching methodology. Duchil had elevated a third-rate fighter to become South Korea's finest athlete, an aspect that deeply intrigued Hansung. Hansung was motivated to align himself with Duchil to establish the foundation of his own strength. In a conversation with Duchil, Hansung drew parallels between their situations, emphasizing their readiness to go to great lengths for their goals. Duchil, however, viewed his past actions as misguided, expressing regret and a desire to avoid repeating such choices. He cautioned Hansung against making foolish decisions driven solely by immediate outcomes, as they could lead to dire consequences. Despite Duchil's hesitations, Hansung made a daring offer, promising a hundred million within a day as an advance payment for Duchil's mentorship. Hansung acknowledged Duchil's foresight in predicting the potential pitfalls, yet stated his resolve to proceed, drawing a comparison to Duchil's own past decision to resort to drugs. Hansung's desperation for Duchil's guidance was palpable. Duchil, while regretting his own involvement with drugs, couldn't stand by and allow a young individual like Hansung to tread the same path. He agreed to offer his assistance solely through teaching. Furthermore, Duchil extended a challenge to Hansung, a chance to prove his determination. Duchil asked Hansung to step into the ring with him, a trial to assess Hansung's mettle. If Hansung could endure a single round against him, Duchil would recognize his resolve and accept his proposition. After the encounter with Duchil, Hansung returned home that night bearing bruises. His concerned grandmother inquired about the source of his injuries, expressing a desire to rectify the situation. Hansung told her that he was all right, 
Meanwhile, Duchil sat in his gym, wrestling with his thoughts and acknowledging his status as the worst. Although inclined to decline Handsome's offer via text, he grappled with his decision. The appointed time arrived and Duchil readied himself in the ring as Handsome entered. Duchil conveyed his experience of encountering various individuals in the realm of sports, delinquents, and students seeking to fend off bullies. Regardless of their motives, Duchil observed that once within the arena, these motivations became inconsequential. Duchil shared his perspective that even those confident in their fighting abilities often yielded after a few punches to the chin. The upcoming fight was set for a single round lasting three minutes with no ground fighting. Duchil urged Kansung to cast aside distractions and focus solely on enduring the round. Success would demonstrate an unbreakable will, a quality Duchil sought. As the round commenced, Hansung assumed a defensive stance. Duchil noted Kansung's filmy guard but detected an absence of even an ounce of fear. He aimed to test how this facade might crumble after taking the hit. Duchil moved closer, intending to land a punch. Hansung blocked the punch or so he had thought. Despite his attempt to block, Duchil's punch slipped through, connecting with his nose. The impact sent Hansung sprawling to the ground. Duchil encouraged him to rise, reminding him that only 10 seconds had elapsed. Hansung found himself on his feet once again, bracing himself for whatever challenges lay ahead. Duchil's strikes came crashing in once more, a torrent of incredible speed and power. Hansung did his best to shield himself using his arms, but the force of the blows left his arms bruised and battered. He couldn't help but realize that if even one of Duchil's punches landed properly, it could be fatal. As Duchil paused his assault, Hansung glimpsed a momentary respite, but it was short-lived as a devastating kick suddenly struck his knee. Collapsing to the ground, waves of agony coursed through him, leaving him trembling and gasping for breath. Duchil's voice pierced through the pain and offered a surrender hanging in the air, but defiance surged within Hansung, a fierce determination to withstand whatever came his way, even with three long minutes on the clock. With approximately two minutes remaining, the barrage of blows continued, each strike pushing Hansung closer to his limits. The realization crept in that his stamina was rapidly depleting a grim prospect if the fight persisted in this manner. Desperation clawed at him, he needed to shift the momentum, to seize control somehow. Summoning his remaining strength, he threw a punch at Duchil, only to watch it deftly evade his opponent's agile maneuver. Duchil's retaliation was swift, a punch connecting with Hansung's chin. Overwhelmed, Hansung crumbled, his body meeting the ground, a trickle of blood escaping from his nose and mouth. For Duchil, a sense of relief washed over him as the end seemed imminent after a grueling battle that had persisted for what felt like an eternity. He contemplated that perhaps he had displayed restraint, sparing Hansung from enduring lasting harm during their brutal exchanges. Yet, it was more of an excuse than reality. Duchil acknowledged the internal falsehood he had clung to, realizing he had pushed himself to his limits in the attempt to defeat Hansung, even though it had taken longer than expected. Duchil's gaze fell upon Hansung who, with the aid of the ring's fence, managed to rise once more despite the toll fight had taken. Hansung's plea for Duchil not to leave resonated, a testament to his unwavering resolve. And as he stood, battered and bruised, Duchil felt a flicker of admiration. Could it be that Hansung's determination ran deeper than appearances suggested? With a renewed determination of his own, Duchil aimed to conclude matters swiftly before they spiraled further. Addressing Hansung, Duchil confessed that his previous efforts had been somewhat restrained. Hansung was urged by him to brace himself and be better prepared for what was to come. And then, with the surge of intensity, Duchil's fists were transformed into a blur of motion, and punches rained down on Hansung with astonishing speed. The pattern was recognized by Hansung, and the strikes were blocked by his hand as a shield. The same trick wasn't going to fool him twice. A low kick was expected, and he readied himself. The attack came, and a hard punch landed on his chest. Blood was coughed out as he felt his knees. There was still 1 minute and 30 seconds left. If the next 15 seconds passed without Kansung standing up, it would be indicated that he had lost. The need to stand up was pressing, but his body wasn't obeying. The liver punch had found its mark, and it wasn't merely a pain that could be endured through sheer willpower. Hansung was wanting to be given up by Du Xiol and for him to go home. Hansung somehow wanted to rise and curse himself. The day he had longed for during his 10 years of being comatose and bedridden was finally here.